Hello and welcome to lecture one of the momentum unit in Phys 1104 with the perhaps overly long name of what do things do when left to their own devices. By which I mean we're going to be looking at what happens in the simplest possible situation when we have an object moving along and we just leave it alone so that it'll do its thing. In this unit we're shifting our focus. Up to this point in the course, we've just been learning to describe motion, often mathematically. But now we're going to be looking at what we'll do for the rest of the course, which is explaining what causes motions and what causes motions to change. So what we had been doing is what's called kinematics. What we're now doing is called dynamics. And when you put them all together, this is what we call mechanics, or the particular type of mechanics we're doing is classical mechanics, which is just one subdiscipline of physics. So to start looking at the causes of motion, I'm going to turn that on its head, and I'm going to ask why do things stop moving? So here's a very simple experiment that you should do yourself. Take a book, give it a quick shove, and let it slide along the floor. Now, this may seem really simplistic. This is about the simplest experiment you could possibly do. And yet many or most people, including possibly you, have some pretty serious misconceptions about what's happening here. So sit up and pay attention. First of all, I want to make clear that we're not interested at the moment in the process of you giving it a shove. Your hand and your hand pushing the book is not what we're interested in. It's important that you let go of the book, that it slides along the floor and stops, and we're interested in that whole motion after it leaves your hand. So we know it eventually stops. But why? Why does it stop? Is this just what things do when they're left to themselves? Does any object that we set in motion just eventually stop? So if that were the case, we would say that this is a property of the book, right? A part of bookness is that if you set it in motion, it'll stop. Well, so I'm going to propose a law, but spoiler alert, the law I'm about to propose is wrong, dead wrong. Here's my proposed law. Things in motion eventually stop. Now, I'm proposing this because you might actually believe this. In particular, what you might believe, without having ever really thought very hard about it, is that to make something keep moving, you have to keep pushing on it. That's a pretty common belief. But I'm here to tell you it's wrong, and experiment is going to show you that it's wrong. That's okay. If you believe this, you're in good company. Aristotle thought this. He was a pretty smart guy. And because he was the chief authority on science in Europe and the Middle East for about 1,500 years, there have been a lot of very educated, intelligent people who thought that this law was correct. But they were all wrong. So, depending on what sort of floor you were on when you tried this experiment out, you might have seen different things happen. If you did this experiment on the carpet in your living room, the book probably didn't go very far. In fact, you might not have even noticed that it moved much after it left your hand. But if you did this on your smooth kitchen floor, it probably went some distance after it left your hand and took a while to slow down and stop. So now, walk outside. You know, this is Canada. For all you Americans watching this video in Canada, even in July, you can walk outside and there's a frozen pond nearby. Um, and give the book a slide on the frozen pond, and it's going to go even farther. And it's going to take a lot longer time to slow down and stop. So the surface matters. And clearly, the book stopping is not a property of the book, because it seems to be something to do with the surface. Different surfaces produce different behavior of the book. So the book is stopping, presumably, because the surface is doing something to it that makes it stop. So the book is stopping because the floor is doing something to it. Well, I'm sure you know this is friction. The book is rubbing against the floor, and this is what we call friction. This is an interaction. The floor is interacting with the book somehow. And this is a two-way thing. The book is interacting with the floor. The floor is interacting with the book. 
And for now, we're going to say that an interaction is any way in which objects act, act upon each other, which causes one or both of them to accelerate. So I'm saying here that this is a two-way interaction. Now, from what we just observed, there's not really any evidence of that, right? All we see is that the book is slowing down. But you can make a similar interaction, because when you rub your hands together, there's friction between them. And you know from experience that both of your hands warm up. So this is clearly a two-way interaction when things rub on each other. So the reason the book goes farther on the pond than it does on the carpet is that there's more friction on the carpet than there is on the pond. Or we would say that the book has a strong interaction with the carpet, but only a weak interaction with the pond. But that begs the question, can we set up a situation where there's no interaction? In other words, where the book would be moving along a frictionless surface and would move at constant velocity. The best easy way to eliminate friction in an experiment is to use something like an air puck. So this is basically just like a little hovercraft. It moves along on a cushion of air, and so it's not touching a surface at all, and there's no friction. There is a little bit of air drag, and so it would still slow down, although a careful analysis of this motion shows that it's actually speeding up, which just shows that the floor in our lab isn't level. So with the air puck, it would eventually stop because of air drag. But one of the main reasons we don't use an air puck much in this course is that it leads to complicated collisions. It's hard to make everything happen along a straight line when you're using air pucks. You can, though, make your interactions happen along a straight line if you use low friction carts. Here's a low friction cart moving along a track. And if you carefully analyze its motion, you find it does slow down, but there's very little friction. And this has the advantage of being very easy to set up. Another option, if you've got a lot of money, is that you could go to space. Now your objects moving around aren't in contact with any surface at all, and there's no air drag. Well, I can't afford to go to space, but I can do the next best thing. I can play Kerbal Space Program. Well, of course, Kerbal Space Program isn't really a proper experiment, but it is mimicking what actually happens in real life, and we have done this experiment in real life. Where does this leave us with our proposed law? I hope you see that this tells us this proposed law was wrong. It's inconsistent with our observations. We have to reject it. Things don't just eventually stop, certainly not of their own accord. There are interactions that may or may not bring them to a stop, and we even have ways to get rid of or at least minimize those interactions. So here's a new proposed law. Objects in motion move at constant velocity unless their velocity is changed by interactions. Note, there's a phrase in there that is loaded with meaning constant velocity. Remember that doesn't just mean constant speed, it also means constant speed in the same direction. Or in other words, we're saying that in the absence of interactions, things move at constant speed and in a straight line. The original proposed law seemed reasonable, but it only seemed reasonable because our everyday lives are dominated by friction, and it's a little hard to think about what the world would be like without it. But we can now see. But having thought about that, we've come up with something else. If we want to study interactions other than friction, well, friction sort of gets in the way, doesn't it? Because we're going to have to disentangle the effects of friction from the effects of other interactions. Unless, of course, we can minimize the friction. And so we'll tend in many experiments to try and minimize friction. So here's x component of velocity versus time graph for the cart moving along the track. And the only thing it's really interacting with is the track by friction. And you can see it's slowing down. In fact, we can take a slope off of there and find it's slowing down at a rate of about 4 centimeters per second squared. Well, one thing I could do to try and compensate for the friction is try and tip the 
track a little bit. If the card is going slightly downhill, I might be able to cancel out the effect of friction. Now, of course, if you overdo it, you end up with a cart that's speeding up, like this one is, at about 5 centimeters per second squared, but in principle, this will work. One other approach you can take is just to say, well, I know friction is going to change the velocity of the cart, but if it only changes it a bit during my experiment, then I can approximate that as a zero change. Well, that now means you set a threshold for how much you're willing to accept the change in velocity due to friction. And if your experiment goes on too long, you'll exceed that threshold. So, for the book on the carpet, you have a very short time to get your experiment done before friction has had just too much effect on the book's velocity. Whereas if it's on ice, you have a long time to examine the motion of the book and still approximate the situation as frictionless. That sets us up for me to introduce what we're going to do for most of the next lecture in this unit. Here is a standard sort of experiment that we should be able to learn quite a bit from. We're going to think about two identical carts on a track. I know they don't look identical, they're different colors. Hopefully you accept that the color shouldn't matter much. And we're going to call these standard carts, because we've got a whole whack of them and they're all more or less the same. And the point here is that these interact with the track weakly. That's the point of these. The friction is very small. And so we can set things up so that we can examine the effect of the interactions between the carts and more or less ignore friction. And we can have the carts interact with each other in a number of ways. On one end, each of these carts has Velcro. So we can make carts bump into each other and stick to each other. On the other end, they have magnets, but they're oriented not so that the carts stick together magnetically, but so that they push each other apart magnetically. And so now what we can do is we can make the carts collide without touching each other using the magnetic ends. Now you may think that sounds like a contradiction in terms. What the heck do you mean, Jeff? Collide without touching each other? Doesn't the word collision imply that they touch each other? Well, physicists use the word collision a little differently from everyday people. What a physicist means when they say collision is an interaction between two objects which lasts only for a brief time. And so when two carts come close to each other and interact magnetically and push each other away, that counts as a collision. So here is one example of the sort of collision we'll look at where you see the two carts, in this case, moving towards each other. And if you look closely, you can perhaps tell that they didn't actually touch during that collision. So we will look at many examples similar to that in the next lecture.